So, looks like I'm going to go into the lunch hour. Do any of you need to have any plans to be make phone calls or anything for lunch? I'm going to go into the, into the lunch. Okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your service. Uh, you have a tough job. We talked about this uh, almost seven weeks ago when we first met. Uh, you came in and filled out your questionnaires, and, and we talked about uh, hardship and bias, and, and we talked about that this would be a difficult case. So uh, you were asked if you could be fair and impartial, reserve judgment till the end, and we're getting close to the end. So uh, you were asked to be patient and attentive while putting your job, your family, uh, your life on hold. Uh, so again, thank you. And uh, thanks to opposing counsel. Um, you know, we're, we're small town lawyers. We're not from Boise. Uh, we see each other frequently. We have to get along because we have a lot of cases together. Our system is adversarial in nature. We're called opposing counsel. But we do respect each other, and we respect the positions and the jobs that we have to do. Uh, you've seen a lot of PowerPoints over the past uh, month, and uh, I'm sorry that I, I don't have one. So I'm just going to talk to you, if that's okay, and talk to you about uh, the evidence and the arguments and the law. and. Uh, my clients always ask me, why does the prosecutor start and end? Uh, so after I'm done, then the this, this state gets to have another go crack at it. And that's just because of their burden of proof, that the state has the burden of proof. So they get to go first and they get to go last. And so my clients always wonder, that's not fair. It's, just our system. That's how it works. So who is Lori Vallow? Uh, what happened? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Why did it happen? That's what you've been asked to figure out. And that's what you need to be convinced of beyond a reasonable doubt. So you've heard a bit about her background from her sister, her son, her friends. Uh, she was born in 1973 in California. She turns 50 next month. Uh, raised there, dad, mom, brothers, sisters, uh, attended schools there. Uh, got married right out of high school, got divorced. Uh, went to beauty school, got married again in Texas. Her son Colby, who you met, born and raised in Texas and Arizona. Uh, she worked hard as a single mother, uh, got married and divorced again, and her third marriage was to Joe Ryan in Texas. Tylee was born. You've heard a lot about Tylee. Uh, she had some medical issues. Children needed protected from her third husband, so a divorce. Uh, court involvement, fourth marriage to Charles Vallow, lived in Texas and Arizona and Hawaii. You've heard about that. Charles had two kids. Lori had two kids. So they adopted a child to have one together, and that was JJ. Kid, five kids uh, between them. Uh, five kids forever. You heard what that was about. You heard that J.J. Uh, had medical issues when he was born and uh, and that Charles and Lori were a good fit for him and uh, they loved him and they cared for him. So then the story about Lori Ballow as you have heard, changes dramatically in October of 2018. Uh, who is Chad Daybell? Uh, this, she had read some of his end of the world books, 
She knew about some of his sayings. Uh, immediate, the first, the, the first time they met, uh, he told her they were married in previous lives. They had multiple lives, multiple probations. We are archangels. We have other names like Methuselah and Raphael and James and Elena. Uh, we've been selected to lead 144,000. Our mission on earth is to prepare for the second coming of Jesus. Uh, evil spirits are real. When they possess a body, they need to be cast out. People have light and dark ratings. Uh, and then she and Chad were married in the temple, and Jesus was there. So quite a remarkable change from the people who knew Lori. Uh, what the heck is going on? Uh, how can how can this be? Uh, so fast forward a year from October of 2018 to November of 2019. One year after meeting Chad, uh, four people are dead. Uh, one of those deaths you don't consider as guilt for this case. That's, it's really difficult for jurors to do. Wait a second, you told me that Charles was killed, but you don't want me to consider it for guilt. Uh, but for some other reason, what other reason is there? So the judge gave you an instruction about that, and and that's that's difficult. That's difficult for lawyers to figure out. And I, so if you have questions about that, that that's a tricky instruction. Uh, so three others are dead in Idaho. Lori's arrested first, as you heard the jail calls, and then Chad. Uh, so you've now heard about summary of the indictment, what she's charged with. I talked to you uh, weeks ago about pay attention to who does what. Uh, pay attention to a uh, burden of proof that I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to call a witness. My client doesn't have to testify. And you can't hold any of that against me. You can't hold it against her. Uh, because sometimes that just happens in a trial. And so it's not for you to guess who or why, uh, but to just consider the evidence that's been presented. So we, the judge has talked to you about what reasonable doubt means, what presumption of innocence means. Uh, and this is an important job that you have to do. And, uh, and so again, I, I want to thank you for that. Pretty soon, six of you are going to get bumped. And that is terrible. To have to sit through a trial, there's 18 of you, and the, and the judge is going to pick name, numbers out of a hat to see who stays and who goes. Because only 12 can deliberate at once. And so uh, I think the plan was that during a long trial, someone's going to get sick, someone's going to have uh, issues at work or at home or a death in the family. Something's going to happen that it's going to, some of you aren't going to show up. And all of you showed up, every single one of you. And that typically the, when we have so many alternates, there's a reason for that is because over a long time, uh, things happen at home. So it's super bad to sit here for seven weeks and then have to go home and don't even get to deliberate. And so for you alternates who get bumped, again, we don't know who you are yet. Uh, I'm, thanks again for your service, but I'm, I'm sorry you don't get to de deliberate with your fellow jurors. So since the trial started, you've been able to see my client. You've been able to see her. 
responses to the evidence. We've been able to uh, see all the evil eye glares that she gets from the audience directed toward her every single day. You've been able to see the witnesses. You've been able to see the exhibits. And you've been able to listen to the tapes. Uh, six times during this trial, you heard my client's voice. Uh, Detective Stubbs, Gibb, <laughs> Colby Ryan, Summer Shiflet, Chad Daybell, and a podcast with others. So if you want to remember how she responded, what she said, go to those six pieces of evidence. And you can listen to them again in the jury room. So uh, is this case about money, power, and sex? So that's the state's theme of the case. I respect their theme, and I'd like to, I'd like to talk about it. Uh, so is this case about money? Well, you have an exhibit, 68A, and this exhibit that was admitted is Tylee buying a car in April of 2019. Charles Vallow is the co-signer. Charles tells the bank that he's a full-time professional marketer that he makes $500,000 a year. Charles says this in Exhibit 68A. So in other years, he's, Charles has stated he makes $400,000 a year. That's in Exhibit 66D. Either way, the Social Security money that she'll make from a dead spouse will never equal 400,000 or 500,000 a year. Never. So that social security money, did Lori with a spouse who makes 400,000 to 500,000 a year really want to kill Charles for money? That, that just doesn't make sense. The math does not add up there. So, uh, so would she leave Charles and go to Chad for money? And what did we learn about Chad and money? According to Samantha Gwilliam, he's an author who has gone bankrupt because he can't sell enough stupid books about the end of the world. So his wife, Tammy, who would rather stay home, with their five kids, she has to work at a school for $15,000 a year. And then from an insurance agent, we learned that Chad almost qualifies for Medicaid, but not quite, so he had to find an insurance plan because he made twenty to 30000 a year. So Lori wanted to ditch Charles Vallow, who makes four hundred to 500000 a year, and go to Chad, who makes twenty to 30000 a year, and she wanted to do that for money. That, my math, that just doesn't doesn't add up. So then the state says, well, maybe uh, she killed for power, and this is about power. So Lori wanted power. So how did that work out, Lori? In the year that Chad convinced her that she was a sexual goddess and a leader of the 144,000, and that she was going to save the world, how many converts did she have? Zero. I'm counting a big fat zero. How many converts did Chad have? Again, we have to get to 144,000. How many converts did Chad have? I count maybe six. Uh, Melanie Gibb, Zulema Pastinas, Audrey Baratario, and three from the same family. Lori Vallow, Alex Cox, and Melanie Pedro. Was Ian Pulowski a convert to the cause? Nope. David Warwick? Nope. 
April Raymond, no. Colby Ryan, no. Summer Shiflet, no. So this great and wonderful cause of saving the world, uh, getting ready for Jesus to come, we need to gather up the 144,000. And in one year, we got six. Chad got six. Lori got zero. So, again, doing some simple math. Chad and... Chad has 143,994 people left to gather before Jesus comes. So at the rate of six people a year, it'll take Chad uh, 24,000 years to get his army assembled. So the math is ridiculous. So is this case about sex? Uh, you want to have sex outside of marriage, you know, go for it. Happens every day in America, unfortunately. So use your reason and common sense when you look at pictures of Chad and you look at pictures of Charles. Uh, was that a physical attraction? Uh, to trade in Charles for Chad, was that a trade up? Or was that a trade down? Is she falling in love with Chad because of his money? No. She's reading his books during a vulnerable time in her life. And this guy is telling you you're a goddess. A sexual goddess, no less. And you're special and amazing and wonderful and by the way, we've already been married in previous lives, so it's not really cheating. And we, and also by the way, we were best friends with Jesus, and so if Jesus approves, then everything's okay. So that's quite a pickup line by Chad to Lori, and it worked. How did that work? Pretty, pretty scary that that pickup line from Chad to Lori would work. So what did the evidence tell you? What were you convinced of beyond a reasonable doubt? Her children are dead. No question about that. But did she kill anyone? And that's where the state concedes. Yeah, these, these people are dead, but did Lori do it? So you listened to 60 witnesses, you received hundreds of exhibits, and there's literally thousands of exhibits you can review that are on those flash drives. So I want to go over some of that with you. 60 witnesses included city police, county police, state police, federal police. Uh, they have a lot of resources available to them, as we found out. And you can find out a lot of stuff about someone. And, and what I've learned about doing trials over the years is that you will pick up on something that I didn't. And this juror will pick up something that that juror didn't. And why is that? Because we all have our own common sense and our own reason. And we all have our own life experiences on which to draw. So we see things differently, and that's okay. Uh, that's what makes this a great system. For you 12 jurors from 12 different backgrounds to get together and talk about this. So I'm just going to point out some of the witnesses, not all. You have your notes to rely on. If I state things differently than what you state, that what you wrote down, then as the judge said, rely on your memory, uh, not mine. So the first witness here in this trial was Kay Woodcock, Charles' sister. 
She described Charles and Lori as the all-American family. They were great parents. She trusted her brother, Charles. She trusted Lori. Uh, they were good parents. They each had two kids. Then they adopted one together, and it was just perfect. And she told you, as every other witness, something changed in late 2018 or early 2019. Uh, Brandon Boudreau, he testified, gosh, Charles and Lori were, were great. Uh, my kids played with their kids. I loved that family like my own. But then all of the end of the world talks ramped up and things got weird. Uh, so Charles died. I got divorced. I got shot at, uh, and so things just got really weird really quick. Uh, Officer Hermosillo, what a tough job he has uh, when he had to describe the, the stench, the smell of decaying bodies uh, during a search of Chad Daybell's property. That was, that was pretty brutal. Uh, and what did you tell you? He said, Chad Daybell, when the cops showed up, called his lawyer uh, to make sure that the cops could be there. And what's Chad doing? He's outside looking over his shoulder. And then he sped away and got arrested. Uh, so when Chad was looking over his shoulder, what's that inference? that Chad knew what was in his backyard. He knew that time was short for him. So then Detective, or uh, Captain Wilmore, captain at the jail, he, uh, he recorded a phone call Lori made from the jail to Chad when he was at his property. And uh, when I listen to this call, it's apparent to me that Lori, that Lori does not know what's in Chad's backyard. But I'm Lori's lawyer, so don't trust me. Uh, listen to it again. So that's the way I hear it. Lori does not know what's in Chad's backyard. She knows her kids are missing. She knows that kids aren't with her. She knows that they're safe and happy, whatever that means. If that means people are dead, if people are safe and happy, if they're in heaven. Um, but does she know that Chad and Alex stuffed her kids in Chad's backyard? So listen to it again, and you make your determination. So then we have other witnesses about, uh, uh, and I know weirdness isn't a legal term, but that's the only way I can describe this, all this just, this religious babble. Uh, all about, uh, you've been mar married and, <laughs> previous lives, multiple probations, uh, multiple lives, uh, special missions on earth, uh, light and dark scales, uh, contracts with Jesus or contracts with Satan, um, just uh, it's a lot of stuff that really does not make sense. Um, so you have to sort through that to see... Um, Again, in America, in America, you can believe how you want, but uh, you can't go killing people. And so, what are they talking about? What's up? What is all this religious talk? Then uh, Melanie Gibb records Lori. You'll have a chance to listen to that. That's where Lori says, with Chad sitting right there, the kids are safe and happy. And so... Uh, 
Does she know her kids are dead? Well, she knows they're not with her. Does she know that Chad and Alex were out in the backyard together? Remember all the GPS data? Lori's not there. Lori's not in the backyard when Chad and Alex are. She's not coming and going to Chad's property on those days that the state points out. She's not there. They're calling her. They're texting her. Are they texting about, hey, today's the day we're going to kill some people. Is that okay with you? We don't know that. Or are they saying, yeah, I'm just running an errand. I'll be back. Do you want uh, a real Coke or a Diet Coke? We don't know the content of those text messages. Unfortunately, we have lots of content of text messages about the James and Elena story. We have lots of that crap. But we don't have any text about today is the day we kill people. So look, look for that. Look for the lack of evidence about who's doing what. Part of your job. That's part of your job to figure it out. And if lack of evidence is, is something that the state hasn't shown, you can't hold that against me. You can't hold that against my client. You hold the lack of evidence against the state because they have the burden of proof. And I didn't make up those rules. The judge didn't make up those rules. We're all following the law. And that's what the law tells you to do. And so we have other witnesses. Uh, Chad's blessing on uh, Alex. Uh, you can listen to that if you, get, if you want to. Listen to that again. Uh, just to me, it's, it's craziness. Uh, opening the portals of time, third creation, fourth creation, great warriors exalted in the fourth creation could have gone on to exaltation, but came back in the fifth creation. In the heck is Chad talking about? Uh, He's the leader of his new church, the Church of the Firstborn. He calls himself a patriarch. Uh, just, just goofy stuff. You hear from other, other witnesses about this, uh, religious talk. Um, you hear from Colby Ryan, uh, my client's son. Uh, Lori was a great mom. She did everything to protect us kids. I would never think she'd do anything to harm anyone. She taught us to do good, to follow Jesus. After she met Chad Daybell, she changed. Her beliefs changed. That telephone call that you heard, and again, if you want to hear it again, please do. Uh, just so painful. so painful for for Colby um, you heard from April Raymond her Lori's friend from Hawaii Lori was nice and normal um, she was a friend a neighbor we went to church together and then Lori came back a year or two later for a visit and she had changed she talks, talked about demons. She talked about people being possessed. She talked about leaders of the 144,000. She asked me if I would join them and be separated from my children to join them. And I could leave my children with their father. And what was April Raymond's response? Um, no thanks. Um, I'll, I'll stay here in Hawaii. But 
but uh, good luck to you on your mission. You heard from uh, Sidney Shank, a BYUI student hired by Lori for babysitting JJ. Now, if Lori has a plan to kill her kid next week, why go to all the trouble to hire a babysitter? Why bring the babysitter over and introduce her to JJ and the medicines and the routine and the school? Why check JJ into school if you're going to kick kill your kid next week? Why do that? Because Lori didn't have a plan. The state wants you to think that this was Lori's plan to kill her kids. But exhibit, look at Exhibit 82A. It's Lori's rental application for a Rexburg apartment. It's dated August 14th, 2019. It's two weeks before she moves to Idaho. She wants to rent in Rexburg. So exhibit 82A is a rental application. She puts on there that she has two kids, Tylee and JJ. She puts on there that she's living on Social Security income. So if her plan was to kill the kids as she got to Idaho, in fact, the state saying Tylee went missing the same week they got to Idaho. Uh, why list her kids on the rental application? If you're moving from Arizona to Idaho, uh, why not go drop off the kids somewhere else? Why not? Why tell everyone you have two kids? Why enroll them in school? Why hire a babysitter? The only thing that makes sense to me is that she didn't have a plan. She wanted to be with Chad. They were obviously having an affair. Chad told her all the time about dark and light things. But there was no plan by Lori to kill her kids, or else she wouldn't have done that. Uh, so she... Did she lie about it? Yeah, she did. When people started showing up, hey, where are your kids? And notice that she lied. Well, they're in Arizona. Well, they're in with Grandma. Uh, they're at a movie. That's right. They're at a movie, uh, Frozen 2. Um, so all lies. So why was she doing that? To protect Chad, her lover, her eternal, in how many worlds, companion. Uh, how can someone have that much control over you? And we've, we've heard about that, that over, over the years, haven't we? that reason and common sense of people just go out the window sometimes when religious principles are involved. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to us, does it? Um, we heard evidence from the FBI um, that one thing the FBI pointed out is that Lori did not get life insurance for the children. Okay, so they're saying she's cunningly crafting a plan to knock off all these people. Wouldn't, how about go get an insurance policy on the kids? No proof of that, is there? So she didn't go get an insurance policy on her children. Well, does that tell you maybe she was not planning to kill her kids or else she would have gone? People do that all the time, right? I'm going to go get insurance on someone and then kill them, and then I'll get a bunch of money. And that is no insurance policies 
on the two children. Um, we heard from the FBI about who's out in the backyard. Uh, well, Chad and Alex are out in the backyard, not Lori. Um, and we heard from Summer Shiflet, uh, similar to Colby Ryan, just a real touching, touching witness. Um, known Lori her whole life. I'm Lori's younger sister. I'm close with Lori. She would have never done anything like this. Uh, that conversation is recorded. So if I've misstated anything, listen to it again. I have supported you your whole life. But Chad has lied to you. Chad has deceived you. She also talked about told us about who Alex was. Alex was an adult man stuck in a 16-year-old brain because of a car accident, a traumatic brain injury. That's who Alex was. Uh, Lori Summer told us was a good mother. She loved her children. She took care of them. She protected them from abuse. She never talked about zombies. She never talked about 144,000 or other weird stuff. Uh, she never talked about saving the world. Never talked about light and dark ratings. She taught her children good things. Tylee and Lori were cute together. Lori would never kill her kids. Never agree for someone else to kill her kids. That's what Summer told you. So then we dealt, dove into more evidence. Um, what was the cause of death? Uh, uh, the evidence that that I'm sure you have notes on. I'm sure the photos are burned into your brain that you'd wish would go away, but we'll be, we'll, those photos will be with you for a while. They're hard to hard to delete that stuff. Um, we, we talked about a hair in, on tape, on a piece of duct tape. So, uh, JJ's body had tape wrapped around it, and one of Lori's hairs was found on that duct tape. So, is that a smoking gun? No, not at all. And why not? because that decomposition fluid was also in that bag. The pajamas were also in that bag. Kids' socks were also in that bag. A kid's blanket was in that bag. And so to say Lori's a killer because they found a piece of her hair on duct tape, that, that's not true. I would hope all of you, your mothers, all of, all of you who are mothers, I would hope that your hair is somewhere on your kids' pajamas, your kids' socks, your kids' blanket. It probably is. That doesn't mean that she's a killer. We talked a lot about, uh, about Tammy's death, and uh, and Lori was in Missouri when she was shot at by either a paintball gun or a real gun. Uh, we don't know which because we didn't find any paintball residue, and we didn't find any bolts. So the evidence is we just don't know. We spent a lot of time talking about what we don't know. Uh, and the evidence is clear that Lori was in Hawaii when Tammy died. And what did Tammy die of? Well, natural causes at first, then asphyxia second. And so what, what did the doctor tell you? Well, 
I talked to the police as part of my investigation as to what, what they think happened. That's, that's okay. That's what a doctor's supposed to do, get the history. So the doctor gets the history and says, well, maybe it was asphyxia instead of natural causes. And uh, then the doctor said, well, yeah, I guess it could have also been seizures because she, because Tammy had been on Prozac for a long time. And seizures are a side effect of long-term use of Prozac. So that death is up in the air. Is she, was she even murdered? Is it a natural death? Um, Chad, to, to believe that it's, that she was murdered, uh, Chad is so smooth that he convinced a county coroner, a county assistant coroner, or deputy coroner, and a police, and a, another policeman, that it was all natural causes, and convinced his kids. Because remember, the kids showed up. Oh my, what happened to mom? And Chad convinced them all, sorry kids, uh, mom died in her sleep. Okay, dad. So, um, just, uh, just, just evidence. You're being asked to convict Lori on killing Tammy when Lori's in Hawaii. Uh, you're asked, you're being asked to convict Lori for killing Tammy when do we even know for sure it's a homicide? Has that been, have you been convinced beyond a reasonable doubt? that it's even a homicide. So, um, we hear from the neighbors, good folks, uh, Alice Gilbert and Todd Gilbert, uh, nice people who, who say, uh, yeah, Chad told us that his wife Tammy was going to die before she hit 50 years old. And so if if Chad had told that to the nice neighbors who hung out with Tammy, wouldn't Tammy had also known about her husband's prophecy? Wouldn't Tammy, wouldn't that explain why Tammy increased her life insurance? Not because she, not because Chad was manipulating her to get more life insurance, but because Tammy, what do we, what do we know about that? That, that Tammy was still with Chad. Even how nutty Chad was, she was still there. She still had five kids with him. She went bankrupt with him trying to sell his stupid books and she's still there with him. She's still loyal to him. So her prophetic husband who says, dear wife, you're going to die next year. Would that cause her to increase her life insurance so that her kids could be provided for? Prove to me that that's false. There's no proof that that's false. Then after the nice, uh, oh, and the Lori's statements are also introduced as evidence with the Gilberts as well. So if you want to listen to that, you can. Um, then we hear from Audrey Baratario. And uh, I got a little excited during that testimony. So if I offended any of you, I apologize. Uh, that testimony, uh, I thought the witness was making up stuff. And uh, so, so I got a little excited. But what did we learn from Audrey? Um, well, she's married to Jesus. That's kind of cool. Um, 
I'll follow you to five different states, but I'm really not a follower. Um, and uh, I don't like it when my good friend Lori tells me for no reason that she's going to kill me. Uh, and I'm not going to testify about that under oath uh, because I'm scared. So just, uh, again, more more weird stuff. Um, Chad had been Methuselah in the Old Testament. He had been James in the New Testament. I moved to Missouri because that's where Jesus is coming. And by the way, I'm married to Jesus. I moved to Missouri because uh, that's where Adam and Eve lived. Um, and... Uh, so you just have to sort through that and figure out what's credible and what's not credible with these witnesses. What is real and what is imaginary. We heard from witnesses about uh, texting and all the texting back and forth. Uh, Chad keeps telling Lori what's been revealed to him. Lori keeps asking Chad what's going to happen next. Because uh, he knows he's the equal to Jesus. He's act Chad has actually been to heaven and come back. And so Chad knows everything. Um uh, when Chad's naming of evil spirits doesn't work, oh, it's because another one's there. When uh, sometimes Chad, yep, someone's close to 0%, and then uh, another time, yep, this person's close to 99%. So even, even Chad's making it up as he goes. He can't remember if 0% is where people die or if 100% is where people die. I got, I got that mixed up. Here's a chart that works, says Chad. This is when my friend's wife died, my neighbor died, George Bush, Stan Lee. Uh, so Chad makes references to Stan Lee, Marvel comic. Right. Also makes reference to Harry Potter. Uh, so what's what's going on in Chad's brain? Uh, well, you and I wouldn't believe it, would we? But some people do. Haven't we seen in history uh, that some people follow? Uh, religious leaders when it doesn't make sense to us. Um, so, was it proven who killed Charles? Yes, it was Alex. But you can't consider that for guilt. That's kind of tricky, huh? You can't consider that for guilt on the other three, but for some other reason. Was it proven who killed Tylee? No, but Alex and Chad were at her grave site in Chad's backyard. Alex's fingerprints were on her, the tools. Chad had said, Tylee doesn't like me. He had told that to people. So I'm guessing Chad and Alex on Tylee. Did they prove that Lori directed it or conspired? Of the 15,000 texts that you have in evidence, show me one where it says, from Lori, so when are you killing Tylee? Was it proven who killed J.J.? No, 
But Alex and Chad were at his gravesite in Chad's backyard. Chad got in a scratch fight. Remember that testimony? Chad got in a scratch fight with JJ the night before. Maybe that could explain this scratches on JJ's neck. So witnesses described this scratch fight. Um, so, and how about uh, JJ's burial site? That Alex was only out there, what was it, 17 minutes? Is that what the FBI guy said? That Alex was out there 17, 17 minutes on that day. So certainly not enough time to dig a meticulous grave and bury a child, find a board from the garage, find rocks that lined up perfectly. Certainly not enough time for Alex to do that on his own. So I'm guessing he had help from Chad. And of the 15,000 texts that you have in evidence, show me one where Lori's part of that conspiracy. When are you killing JJ, by the way? There is no such text. We have 15,000 of them, remember? So, why, why can't people escape religious cult figures? Why can't they break out? Why can't they break away from that mind control? The promises are marvelous to some people. They sound like stupid gibberish to the rest of us. Uh, there are examples, you all know of examples, of people uh, committing suicide because their religious leader told them to. And, and you just have to keep asking yourself, why can't people escape? Why can't Lori escape and get back to her good mom life? Lori is not a leader of Chad's new church, the Church of the Firstborn. Lori so wants to testify of Jesus. You heard her on her podcast. She wants to tell the world how much she loves Jesus. She wants to tell you that she personally met him on more than one occasion. But is, Ch is Lori a leader or is she a follower of Chad? She so wants to be a leader, but she's not leading anyone. She's following Chad. She thinks Chad is following Jesus, but he's not. He's unfortunately being led by the storm. Not the first guy to be led by the storm. Um, so, uh, Chad, you'll see in the text, Chad, what about this? What about that? What should I do? Move to Idaho? Lori has never lived in Idaho. She's never lived in a cold place. Uh, she's always lived in warm places like California, you heard, Arizona, Texas, Hawaii. But, Chad, you want me to move to one of the coldest places in Idaho to be near you? Okay, I'll do it. Lori sees Chad as if Chad is Jesus. Lori tells people she's seen Jesus, but yet she still follows Chad. Blessings are being handed out like flies with some of the testimony. Uh, what does that even mean? I bless you. No, I bless you. Well, if you're going to bless me, then I'm going to bless you. What, what does Brandon Bedreau even mean when he says that? That the religious aspects of this group is so intense that common sense has vanished. 
So, uh, groups who actually do follow Jesus, they do good things, right? Jesus never killed anyone. He blessed everyone. He, he taught people how to get along. Jesus taught how to be respectful, how to be helpful. If someone wants your coat, give them your coat and your cloak. If someone wants, if someone wants you to walk a mile, walk two miles with them. However you can help someone, do that. Treat people like you want to be treated. Judge people like you want to be judged. Since you're a sinner, be kind and forgiving to sinners. If someone has offended you, forgive them. That's the Jesus that we know. That's the Jesus that Lori knew. That's the Jesus that Lori taught her children about. That's the Jesus that Lori believed in until she met Chad Daybell. So on your verdict form, there's not a box to check for did Lori have an affair? And we spent a lot of time on that issue, remember? On the verdict form, there's not a box to check to see if a crime was committed in Arizona. How many weeks did we spend on that issue? It's very specific, your verdict form. Did she kill? Did she plan to kill and steal? Not kill or steal, but kill and steal. And the proof has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. If it's not, the law says you must find her not guilty. No one here thinks Lori actually killed anyone. That's why she's charged with conspiracy. Because they think someone else did the killing. So they want you to be convinced that she's part of this plan that there's a specific plan to kill on certain days. So if you find her guilty, will that bring the kids back? Nope. If you find her not guilty, will that bring the kids back? Nope. So you can't be concerned about that. What you are concerned about is following the law and following the evidence follow the law and the lack of evidence. This case is not about multiple lives or multiple creations. It's not about zombies, not about being a leader of the 144,000. If there's anything we learned about a storm, it's that you hide from a storm. You seek shelter from a storm. That's what you teach your kids, and that's what you know. Her sister and her son, those two who testified about her in this courtroom, have known her the longest. They would never imagine she would be guilty as charged. She spent her whole life protecting her children. Thank you again.